Welcome. We're so glad that you're here. This is an exciting event. I will just let you know, my name is Stephanie. I am a pastor at Mill City Church in Northeast Minneapolis, just on the other side of the river. And this event is uh, a dream of mine that happened just a, maybe not even a year ago, which is amazing that here we are having this event. I'll tell you the reason that I had this dream is because I've been a part of uh, Bethel Seminary. I work there part time, and we have a, an initiative called the Work with Purpose Initiative, and it's how we think about how our faith is integrated with the work that we do every single day. A lot of people uh, have tended to learn from the Bible that work is a bad thing because in Genesis 2 it sounds like it is. But don't forget G Genesis 1 where God created us to work and it was a good thing. And yes, there are some hard things about it now, but whenever we step into it with purpose, work with purpose, we are a part of stepping towards what God is doing to redeem all things. Because work is something that God created as good. So don't forget the beginning of the story. This is what we're talking about at Bethel Seminary, and I've been working there for a while, and I noticed that whenever I went to these work with purpose events, which I love, it was a little bit underrepresented by the female gender. <laughs> it seems as though when we have an event that's designed for work and faith integration, no event have we ever hosted that was designed for men, but mostly men attended. Ladies, your voice is important. We need your voice in the story of what God is doing to help us see how our work is a part of human flourishing, our work is a part of joining God's story, and our work is a part of the experiencing the foretaste of what God is doing in the future kingdom when the new heavens and the new earth come and all things are made new. Not all new things. All things are made new, including you and me and our work and our lives. This is what we're about, and we need you to be there. So about a year ago, we were talking about how this underrepresentation was happening, and I thought, well, let's have an event that's designed for women, but also encourage you to join us in some of these work with purpose events that are designed for everybody who is working with purpose, with, the, with trying to do the work of integrating their faith with what they do. You spend most of your time in your waking hours engaging in your vocation, and so we want to equip people to do that as people who are joining what God's doing in the midst of their work. And we do a ton of events about that. I'll mention some of those things at the end. But that's why you're here. And we're so grateful that you are. And so thankful that Thrivent has been willing to host us and to be a sponsor of this event. Many of you who work here at Thrivent, we're so grateful that you're all here. You all have really different experiences in what you do in your vocations. And so we're hoping that the panel can represent uh, some of you in some experience. But I really believe that you can learn from each other regardless of how different you might experience your day-to-day -day vocation. And that's what we're here for today. So I hope you meet some different people and you'll get a chance maybe to do that before you leave. Um, before we go any further, can Elena come up and just welcome everybody here to Thriven and share a little bit more? Thank you, Stephanie. Welcome, ladies. This is actually really exciting for us. Uh, we have been talking about this event for, for a couple months now. And I have to tell you, when we planned the event, we said, let's come in our cafeteria where it's intimate and we can do kind of small group conversation. And we were expecting like 30 to 60 people, I think. Is that what we kind of said? Well, I'm, I'm a finance person and I don't have my calculator handy, but we have way more than 30 people in this room. So thank you for showing up. And let's give each other just a round of applause. It is wonderful that you guys are here with us. And as uh, the voice of Thrivent tonight, in addition to Terry Rasmus and our president, I just want to thank you for being here. And I think I speak for probably everyone in the room that has something on their plate. And I think I speak for everyone in the room where there was probably a moment tonight where you thought, oh, geez, okay, do I go to the event, or I could go grocery shopping, or I could pick up the kids early and bring them to so-and-so, and then do this, and then do that, and then I have some extra work to do, and then I could stop into church and do this. I mean, who had that conversation in your head? <laughs> yeah. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about Thrivent. I know a lot of you guys probably have heard about Thrivent, but Thrivent is an incredible faith-based organization where we step alongside individuals just like you and help you on your journey and with your finances 
and come alongside you and really understand what's important to you, where are you going, and really help you along the way. And so we say we connect faith and finances for good. And that really is what makes us unique in the marketplace, is we are not about amassing wealth just for the, amount of, uh, for the reason of helping you amass wealth. We think about money as a tool. And we believe that everything that we have is a gift from God. And we believe that that is a conversation that should be had in that context. And so I would just love to invite you to have a conversation with anybody that has this red dot on their name tag. If you want to learn more about what we do here at Thrivent, we do have a formal table up the stairs or up the ramp, I should say. And we would love to give you more information about what it means to be a member of Thrivent. I also want to let you know that we are aggressively growing as an organization, and specifically the area that I lead, we are looking for people all the time that are passionate about helping people, that are passionate about, about um, growing a business, that are passionate about um, ha maybe having a little bit more purpose in your work. And so if you're interested in a career at Thrivent, please come find me or come find somebody at our Thrivent uh, table and we'd love to have a conversation with you about what that could look like. So with that, I will again, thank you for being here with us. We really, really hope that you enjoy the evening and that you get so much out of it. There's truly nothing that makes me more happy than seeing a group of women together supporting each other. So enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna add one final plug. This is not the purpose of tonight. Uh, Thriven has just been very generous to host, but I do know that there are a lot of actual financial advisors who are in this room right now. So would you just raise your hand? Raise your hand high, keep it up. So some of you have thought it's somewhere on some to-do list to talk to a financial advisor. I don't know where that list is, I don't know. But am I right, ladies, you'd be happy to talk to anyone tonight about making an appointment just to see what the steps could be? Yeah, okay, that's some nods, good. Thank you, Thrive, and we really appreciate the, the welcome and the hospitality. It's so great, we're so grateful for that. Okay, so I'm gonna introduce a little bit more about myself and then the panelists, and then we're gonna jump right into some questions. We, th we were thinking it would be a little bit more intimate and everyone could ask a question, and <laughs> that's not gonna happen tonight. <laughs> Um, so once again, my name is Stephanie O'Brien, and I'm a pastor at Mill City Church, not too far from here. I also work at Bethel Seminary with a program where we help uh, undergrad students connect to seminary and do a BA and an MA at Bethel in five years, and they'll have an MA in ministry and a BA in really almost anything. So if you're a parent of a high schooler who's like, loves Bible camp, they might be called to ministry, and I apologize for that and also encourage you to send them my way. <laughs> I also have the opportunity to do some teaching at Bethel, some ministry classes, I, and I teach preaching there. If anyone would like to audit, let me know. We'd love to have you. It's a good time. And I also get the chance, sometimes it's an amazing, sometimes it's crazy, to co-host a podcast with Joe Saxon, who's sitting over here, where we made, had the crazy idea to press record on some of our conversations. So if you'd like to listen into those, it's Lead Stories podcast, and um, we've never been the same. You might not be either you get to decide if it's a good or bad change in your life. We talk about leadership and life and what it looks like to, to live on purpose and integrate our faith with what we do. All right, so I'm going to introduce our panelists. Terry was named president of Thrive at Financial in 2015, and I'm sure you have many responsibilities, but one of those responsi responsibilities being uh, leading the career agency system of nearly 2,400 financial representatives who serve more than 2 million Christians uh, in what they've been talking about here. So that's Terry. We'll hear more from her. Thank you so much. You can give her a round of applause. And then we have the aforementioned podcast co-podcaster with me, for better or for worse, Joe Saxon, who's also an author, speaker, a visionary leader and coach who empowers women to step into all the potential that God has created them for. You all got a free copy of her book, The Dream of You, which is, uh, the subtitle is Letting Go of Broken Identities and Living the Life that You Were Made For. And so Joe's going to be available right after this to sign the book if anybody would like to have it signed. And um, that way, if you already have a copy, which I know some of you do, you can give that copy away, and you can keep the one that Joe signs. 
And then finally, we have Heather, who's a new friend of mine. Heather Hammond is the internal communication specialist at EverEve, which is, if you don't know, a national fashion and styling company with more than 85 stores coast to coast. Who's been in, to an EverEve before? Okay, so we know what it is. Uh, you manage internal communications for the company's over 1,500 employees and counting, I'm sure. So can we welcome, oh, we didn't clap for you, sorry, Joe. Welcome Joe and Heather. So now I have, I've asked these women a few questions. I gave them the questions ahead of time. But I have moderated a, a few panels in my day. I wouldn't say I'm a professional, but I'm getting close to being a professional panel moderator. And what I've noticed is we always have more questions than we ever get to because I, for one, love to see where the conversation goes. So we're going to see where it goes today, ladies. But I did give them some, some questions ahead of time. And the first one is just to share some of their story and how they've stepped into their current calling, how they got there, just so you can get to know them a little bit better. And then we'll, we'll see where it, where it takes us. So can we just go in the order that I started? You mind starting, Terry? You want me to start? Yeah. Um, well, I, uh, I'll, I'll quote my mother. My mother has always said that I, I, she's pretty sure that wherever I live, I can find a job. And so I am probably the only dental hygienist, CPA lawyer, president of a financial services company. <laughs> Anyone else know somebody with that? Oh. So um, the story, and I'll be brief, because that's the other thing I've learned being on panels, being brief, is is I really uh, grew up as a child and I had no idea what my calling was. And my dad's first rule and the lesson of life was find your passion because you got to work a long time. And so he literally came home one day and he had decided that he and with his friend, the dentist, had decided I should become a dental hygienist. And so that's why I picked that, <laughs> that it sounded good. But when I was there in college, I discovered the love of learning. And at the risk of becoming a professional student where my mother was quite concerned um, at that time, I went on to get my degree in accounting and uh, then go, went on to law school and practiced law uh, for many, many years. In fact, I was hired at Thrive in here in 2005 as their general counsel. And uh, the reason I came here was quite selfish, and, and I know a lot of the, the Thrivent folks have heard this story before, but I, I, was, I, I wanted to prove that I could build a team and that I could make a difference. And um, I worked at American Express at the time, and I loved American Express, still do, and part of it is now Ameriprise. But I increasingly decided that um, I, I wanted to be in a place where I could actually make decisions, and that was here. And so I was uh, lucky enough to be invited to be the general counsel here, and I got to Thriven, and um, I think I successfully proved to myself I could build a team, but I fell in love with this organization. It is complex, it's challenging, but our mission is so incredible. And I'm often quoted as saying we have the coolest charter on the face of the planet because we, we have this ability to walk alongside our members and help them have a good relationship with money and help them really feel confident and content and we ignite that spirit of generosity that's in all of us. And so that's really why, how I got here. Great. Thank you. All right, Joe. Okay. Um, I'm the child of immigrants, um, Nigerian immigrants to England, and now an immigrant as well. And um, they say in, our, in Nigeria, you can be anything you want as long as it's a doctor or a lawyer. And, um, <laughs> and I heard a comedian say there's another thing. You can also be an accountant. The other option is an absolute disgrace. Those are your... Those are just, <laughs> There's just actually the options. four options. It's yeah, just, there are four yeah, options. Right. And, um, and I wasn't really into any of those, um, but I, I did want to be a journalist. I think I've always been fascinated with people's stories. I've always been fascinated with words. I love words, and I love how stories change things. Um, I had no plan of being in ministry at all. That was not remotely on the agenda. Failed miserably at that, and... Um, and over the years, got involved in working with churches, would be offered jobs and thought, I'd just give it a go. And um, would find myself being given the leadership position of things just all the time. Is that why you laughed when I apologized if any of their children were called to ministry? Yes, I did. Yeah. Because I knew what you were doing. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and... Um, and I think over the years have, have just loved the idea of seeing lives changed. And I think in terms of mission and in terms of purpose, um, I've encountered change and I've and been in environments and cultures and communities where transformation has been good for human flourishing and have wanted to, to always be part of that. I moved to the States um, 14 years ago um, and again was working within churches and, and, it, was, and it was quite challenging. It was, it's always been quite challenging um, for multiple reasons. But um, 
But again, the thing with words wouldn't go away. So I think in the end, how I landed here, here, um, was probably just having more and more opportunities to speak and encourage people to discover what they're about and just to, to discover where their gifts could take them. And finding in this context in the States, it was really helpful to say that to women. Yep. And that it was really necessary to say it to women. And have found to say it again and again and yeah, again. Yeah, and to say it repeatedly yeah. and, and to not apologize for how we've been wired and, and all those sorts of things. And I think then sometimes if you talk a lot, and, I, and you know, the accent gets me discounts here, so it's a win. And, um, and opportunity. I've actually been there for the discount. It, it's, it's, it's like, did you hear her? Where do we get our 20% off? <laughs> you don't get it. I get it. Well, um, yeah. <laughs> Just tagging along. That's true. Um, but um, it, yeah, and I guess now having the opportunity and the privilege to talk to groups about where they're at, whether it's in church context. And one time it was the NFL. That was fun. Um, and in different companies, it's just been fun to do. Great. All right, last but not least, Heather. Thanks. Um, yeah, my story is a little bit uh, meandering. Um, in terms of calling, I think for me, I just sort of put one foot in front of the other one and see what path appears in front of me. Um, I grew up a pastor's kid, um, and then and now I'm a pastor's wife. Sort of unconventional one, I think. Um, what? No, it's a cool one. <laughs> oh. It's great. Thanks. Um, but... Uh, and I, I worked as a teacher. Um, I have a degree in English and theater. And um, but I'm I'm at the heart. I relate to Joe's story. I'm a writer. Um, I love people's stories. Um, and I've um, uh, yeah. I'll, I've been with Every for uh, two and a half years. And I do um, yeah. I do their internal communications. But we're a small company, so I also do some PR. I do some marketing. And, um, but, but through that, I think, um, the, I, I, I guess what I want to say is I have my foot in two worlds in the, I have my foot in the church world and I always have, and I can't get that one out and, but I have a foot outside and I can't get that one out either. Um, and what I do and in my work and in writing communications, telling people stories is extremely pastoral. So. My favorite part about your job is following you and Ever Eve on Instagram. So just shout out for that. It's really fun. <laughs> okay, I'm actually, the, the next question I want you all to think about is just the question of how do you see your faith integrated in what you do vocationally? And so I'm going to have Joe start because maybe it seems like the easiest one, but maybe not. But how do you see who, who God is to you, who Jesus is to you as integrated in what you feel called to do and what you're doing now? Um, and uh, for all of us, just be thinking about, well, how do I see that do have I been able to integrate that? Um, use it as a time to listen to their stories, but what that might mean for you. So, what? How do you see your faith in in Jesus as integrated in what you are called to do? Yeah, I guess when I um, my understanding of of God's kind of thing with humanity was that we had a twofold purpose, like to know Him, but also to represent Him in the world, um, wherever we were. And I I think I've come to, and it's taken me a long time to own it. But I think there's been the reality that my gifts and my abilities are not an accident or a concession. That they are a gift. And as such, they're to be unwrapped. And as such, they're to be invested in, in the world around me. So for me, the, when I'm speaking in front of people, when I'm writing, in whatever context, whether it's church or whether it's in a corporate environment, I, I'm enjoying it with God. Because I think it's, it, I think when I, like for when I see my kids doing something they're good at, I love it. I love watching them thrive. I love watching them fly. And I'm not embarrassed about their gifts. I'm embarrassed about other things, but not their, <laughs> <laughs> but not their gifts. And, and for me, when I see, when I have an opportunity to live how I'm wired, and, and again, for the purposes of it, serving others or freeing others or them coming into their own, I think, I, I think God smiles at that. I think because that's what he designed us for. And I think it brings out the best in humanity as well when we're using our gifts for, to their full potential. Um, you do some coaching of, of leaders who work in Christian environments, who work in churches, but you also coach women who are in the marketplace yeah. and have done different types of things like that. What are some of the things that you are kind of your core messages to the women who need to do the work of integrating their faith in the workplace when it's the marketplace and not uh, something that might have the prefix of Christian? Um, I think there are two things. I mean, I think that I think you guys would know it better than I would. But um, <laughs> um, I think the thing I often say is, I, when I look at the Bible, most of the people who are who are our heroes had jobs. You know, oh, I just spilled that. Um, most of them have jobs, like Deborah. I think this could be a really bad situation, heaven, and it's going to be bad. Um, 
most of them had, like Deborah really was a judge. Lydia really was a businesswoman. She was an entrepreneur. She, and, um, and most of the women who um, Paul thanked, they were women who, who um, Priscilla, she had a foot in both camps. She was a businesswoman and she was a church leader. And so actually the heroes of faith represent the women in this room far more than they represent those of us who work for churches. We see our story in there. We just don't hear them told very often. Um, and so I often encourage us to say, well, well, what do we see Deborah doing? What do we see Lydia doing? And, and all that they're about. And we see God there moving. Um, and it's to the churches, and I point to myself as having been a church leader, I think it's our flaw that we haven't made that story more known. Absolutely. In fact, I'll just say one of the things that we really focus on in the Work With Purpose initiative at the seminary, which equips people like you, but also pastors, is to say, hey, whose responsibility is it that we have created these meaningful sending ceremonies for people who are doing, quote unquote, church work, missionary work? And what does it look like to commission people into their everyday vocations as they represent God into all that they do? And so I've tried to say to any group that I can as a pastor, I'm sorry we haven't commissioned you well. I'm sorry we haven't created spaces where you can feel just as sent by God's spirit into the places that you're going because you are just as much and hopefully as much as any of us who have a title or a vocation that is maybe a paid ministry position. So at my church, we've been working on that and we've had some commissioning and some sendings and it's been really meaningful. We still send missionaries. We still send folks who are going into ministry, but all vocations are meaningful when it comes to what, how God uses all of us in all those places. And I will say, I think we've, mis, uh, we've made a mistake when we've started to elevate certain vocations over the other in that way. And you can start to think about, there's more than just the elevating ministry that it's vocational. Start thinking about the different vocations that we tend to elevate. And we've got a really interesting list going down the line that we could all say, oh yeah, we tend to God uses us all in all of those different spaces, and we are all experiencing uh, God's kingdom in the midst of those spaces and have an opportunity to look for what God's doing in those spaces. And so I just want to encourage all of you. That is an important thing for people like me and, and Joe, but for people like me who lead churches to express and maybe even to apologize and say we need to do better with that. So let's continue on. And Terry, would you share the answer to that question for yourself? Yeah, and I actually wanted to build on what Joe was saying because I, I do think that, especially at Thrivent, we say you know everything we have is a gift from God and that generosity is an expression of faith. And the gifts are, are really unique to the person. And, and I think it's allowing people the space to really think about what are those unique gifts that God has specifically given each one of us. And then how do we really leverage those gifts uh, because he was very thoughtful when he, he, he you know, bestowed on each of us those gifts. And so how do we leverage them and use them? And I agree. I mean, I think sometimes we, we, um, are, are, uh, we are not thinking of really happiness in your calling and how do you really, um, for yourselves, identify what is your true purpose and what is your true calling. And I think sometimes when we elevate other vocations over others, I mean, people, then it is work and it becomes a four-letter word instead of this wonderful place where you get to have a meaningful contribution and make a huge impact and really serve out your calling. It is a four-letter word, but it's not a four-letter word. <laughs> All right, we got it. All right, Heather, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think to... Um, for me, I, I've, I've really struggled with this because, because of the elevation factor, growing up as a pastor's kid, being a pastor's wife, I feel like, oh, if I'm not, if I'm not being paid by the church, then I'm not doing like true ministry work. I'm not, I'm not like really living out my faith, right? I don't know if anyone else has felt that way, but, um, I, I read this, um, I read this prayer about 10 years ago, um, uh, by Brother Lawrence. He wrote, well, he didn't write it, but there's a series of his prayers, Practicing the Presence of God. And he was a, he struggled with this. He, he had this quote, or he had this prayer. He was um, a cook, right? He was a cook. And he struggled that he didn't have, like, these lofty kinds of jobs as a monk. He was a monk. And um, he, he wanted to be keeping the hours in the night. Because, again, and he's talking about this elevation thing. Like, oh, that feels more spiritual than just making dinner, making lunch, cleaning up. Um, and his prayer became, though, um, uh, and this is just a, a part of it, but he said, God, Lord of all pots and pans and things, make me a saint by getting the meals and cleaning up and doing the dishes. And I thought, man, that is it. That's it, whatever it is. 
And for me at that time, I did have little kids, so I was like doing a lot of cleaning up and a lot of cooking. Um, but, but for me, it's, if you're making spreadsheets, if you're, um, I, don't, I don't know what else you do. All kinds of things. Posting on Instagram. If you're posting on Instagram like I job. do for my job. Um, whatever it is, like make me a saint by doing this task, whatever it is in front of me. Absolutely. I would love for you to share just a little bit more about Ever Eve as a company, which is not a Christian company, but it has uh, faith connections for many of the people who worked there and founded it. What are some of the ways you see the purpose behind the fact that, sure, we can anybody can sell clothes to women unless they're not good at it, and then we will not buy them, unless it's a really good sale. But what what is some of the, the purpose behind that, that Ever Eve's trying to, to engage with her human flourishing in the world and for, for women? Yeah, I actually feel really grateful to work for a company our, whose mission is to inspire every mom to embrace her beauty and power. Um, that is a spiritual mission. And um, we live out that mission each day through providing uh, an experience and through connecting with women who come into our stores or experience our site or whatever it is, however they connect with Ever Eve, like we are there to empower them and inspire them to embrace beauty and power. Um, and so for me, um, one, one example, I guess, in internal communications, I was actually initially hired as the storyteller, which is an awesome title. <laughs> it was my favorite title ever. <laughs> Um, but I, so what I did when I was first hired was I just managed this little blog, an internal blog that was set up to perpetuate our core values. And our core values are more of like the sort of spiritual goals of the company, if you will. And it's not a Christian company per se. Um, it's a retail company, but, but we have these values that we want to live out, for, for example, like our mission. And, um, so it was my job to listen to the stories of employees across the across the nation, across the company, um, all these stores coast to coast, um, to them, the stories of them living out their core values and then retell them. Make sure that those stories are being perpetuated in our company and we're building on our core values from storytelling. And so it was my job to listen to people and listen to ways that they connected with women across the country. And I'm telling you, these stories are powerful. There are stories of um, women who come in who's lives are wrecked and they're having a hard time and their friends bring them in to just like get to like have a get some outfits um a fresh start um I'm thinking about like if I should share some specifics but it's um it's really beautiful to uh to hear these stories and these women leave feeling lifted up yeah they're like dressed head to toe but fashion is just a vehicle to love and that's what um we say over and over that Fashion, fashion is the way that we can lift people up. And for women, that's huge, you know, like the way you feel about yourself. And when you get dressed in an awesome outfit, um, Elena, like I, your outfit is real cool. <laughs> yes. And like, I was just thinking like, you just feel good when, you've got, when you're dressed head to toe and you can step into what Joe is saying, the life that you were meant, created to live and who you were created to be. And it's also an expression and that, Whatever. Okay, I'm done. I love it. I love it. For now. No, and there's just this sense of when, you, and I, I'm not just saying this. When you come into Ever Eve, it, it feels like we're saying to you, we want your outside to look like the best version of your inside. Not totally. maybe if you put something nice on the outside, <laughs> we can, you know what I'm saying? And there's so many times, I'll just be honest, when I've gone into a store and someone has made me feel like, oh, we don't carry your size here <laughs> or something. And it's just so different. It's just a different experience. And when I have let people style me, which I hesitate every time, and then I let them pick things out for me, and I go, I never would have thought that that would look good on me. And then somebody with their sweet, loving persona hands me that thing that I think is way too bright for me. And then I still, <laughs> I put it on. It's just, it, it is something that connects you inside and outside in this really meaningful way. Yeah, and the goal too is like to connect first. Yeah. To make yeah, a connection first before you sell anything. Absolutely. Which I think can apply to anyone. Good. Okay, so we're going to go there with this next question and the topic of your experience as women in the workplace. Here we are in the season of hashtag me too and so many other things that are many people have used the term of a reckoning, of a, a, a moment to tell the truth, of to come to, to so many different things are happening 
media-wise and all of that. So not that we want to have a conversation about that, but in light of that, what has being a woman in the workplace like been like for you? But also maybe um, as you've journeyed alongside other women who have had to figure out what it looks like to be fully whatever their title job is in that moment, but also to be fully a woman and to step into that. So um, anybody just want to take a stab at that? I don't need to call on anyone. Everyone's so polite. <laughs> well, should I start? Yes, we'll start with Terry, you. please. Thank you. <laughs> we'll start with you. I'm probably the eldest here, I would guess. The, um, so along the way and in my career, I've had some incredible mentors, and both uh, male and female. And so in the workplace, for the most part, I have felt extraordinarily supported and always felt like I had a place to go if I had a question or if something happened. I will tell a funny story because it, at Thrivent, I uh, used to be in charge of, uh, we called it church and community relations, and, and so we did our annual pilgrimage to the three largest Lutheran church bodies. Um, the ELCA is in Chicago, and there we even currently have a female bishop uh, who heads the church. Uh, the second largest is the LCMS. And um, when I would go to St. Louis, I was the only woman uh, because they, the church leadership there had to be ordained and they didn't ordain women. And so I would be in this room with all of these men. Uh, but I have to say that they were also very conscious of it and really went out of their way to make me feel welcome, which was nice to see. And then, uh, ironically, the third uh, largest was Wells, which is in Milwaukee, and their president, I came to rely on him to really help as we were navigating the space of religion because, like it or not, the denominations, and I don't care if you're Lutheran, Episcopalian, Presbyterian, Baptist, there's a, there's a conservative side and it spans the globe to the liberal side, and, and every, every church and every religion, I think, experiences that. And so, you know, making sure and, and asking for help as you're trying to navigate that, um, and I think that applies probably equally to men and women, but I did find that they were always so helpful, and like I said, despite the church policy, always made me feel welcome. That was lovely. <laughs> I like that. I just, I thought, oh, thank you. Um, it's been a mixed bag. There have been, um, over the years, I, I mean, there were times when um, I would hear racist jokes and be expected to join in. Um, yeah, huh? um, and sexist jokes and expected to join in. Um, definite, I mean, I remember there was one time when I was speaking somewhere and they, they didn't realize that Joe was a woman. And, and Surprise! It was a ch and I was like, <laughs> jazz hands. Um, <laughs> And they said, they, and the guy said, you know, I expect, and the, and the pastor said, I expected that when you said Joe, it was a woman, and he walked out the room. And it was like 10 minutes before I was due to speak, and I thought, well, here we go. And um, I mean, I did it anyway, because I was there. But, um, but I, I think there are these, there, there have been many moments when it's been very clear. Um, there have been events which have turned me down or that have been refused a building, like churches would say, you can't do that event if she's speaking because we don't have women who speak. Um, there have been times when, I mean, the, the racist stuff has been, more, has been more latent, you know, in terms of what stereotype you need to fit into, um, the language used, the mi micro and macro aggressions. Um, I think in terms of, and, it, and it's been a mixed bag. There have been some wonderful places and wonderful spaces where people have leveraged their privilege and their positions so that because they thought it was the right thing to do. You know, they, they felt that they had the resources and they wanted to encourage and empower. And I've, to be honest, I've seen it across the board. It would, I would say there have been places who would say they're really pro-women in leadership who have systemically really not been. And other places who would say they're really conservative, who I'm like, I don't know your definition of conservatism, but this isn't it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It, it hasn't worked that way. I think one of the hardest things has been the loneliness. Um, um, Ashonda Rhimes, who I love, talked in a book about being in an environment where she's the first only different. FOD. FOD, the first only different. And I have been in many, ex multiple, multiple times the first woman speaker, the first woman of color. Um, speaker in an environment, and it's always it's always a vulnerability in that moment um, to to stand there and and to remind yourself 
yes, you are the person for the job. And even if, um, and yes, people are going to get used to the fact that you're here. And yes, you carry on doing what you're wired for and how you're wired to do it. And, um, and yes, you um, be on that board, chair that board. And it may be unusual, and we're all just going to have to get used to it together. Um, that's been a reality. I think in terms of coming alongside other people, when I'm at conferences, I speak at a lot of events, and I often meet a woman in the bathroom crying. And, um, and that woman crying is often um, of different age groups, different generations, um, different cultural or ethnic backgrounds, same story of where they ask, is it possible? Am I allowed to be me? Um, am I allowed? To, I've always had these gifts. I've always had these abilities, but no one's affirmed them, and um, no one said it, it's okay. I need to know. I'm. I'm and the, the hard, the, the most poignant part of it, is that they're not just asking if their gifts are okay. By that point, they're asking if they're okay. You know, and so they, so they'd say, I need to know I'm okay, because they have been tolerated, or not, and not been celebrated and invited in. So. Yeah, mixed bag. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I would say I've for sure been that woman crying in the bathroom after I've heard someone speak and said, like, or watched. I remember what the first time I heard a woman preach, and I was like, they can do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for me, I, I learned that women had to take a certain path because of my faith. And not specifically my faith, but the denomination in which I grew up in, um, was very conservative. Um, and my dad being a pastor, like, I, I have I have two brothers, but I, I was never invited to pray. I was never invited to read scripture, like my brothers were. Um, and, I mean, I... I it was. It, it wasn't until I was maybe in my in my mid to late twenties that I thought, "Gosh, if I had been born a boy, I'd be a pastor right now." Someone would have put me on that track. Um, and and that was hard for me. And now I haven't become one, so maybe not. You know, <laughs> so maybe that wasn't my thing. But but I think like. You wonder, it, you wonder if I that's wonder. what would have happened. I wonder, yeah. and um, it's it's hard to have this conversation when m um, the view of women that I've had was shaped so negatively by my faith. Um, and so when I hear um, stories of, of the women in the Bible and that I wasn't told any of those stories. No one, t no one told me that Jesus told a woman after the resurrection that she was the first evangelist. Are you kidding? I never heard that till I was in my 30s. Last week, Easter. I think it was last week. <laughs> I think it was just last week. Um, so so that, that set me on a, a kind of a strange trajectory even in my work, too. So I, when, when Steph asked this question, I had this story pop in my mind. Um, when I was first out of college, I was a teacher, a high school English teacher in central Virginia. And um, so this is, this, this is about 15 years ago, and my principal is getting ready to retire. So he's of a, of a very different generation. But I knew, um, like someone told me, and I don't even know how you know this or if it was just a rumor, but I knew that when I'd go in for my review that I needed to wear a skirt because that's what women did. And I did it. And I think about that now and I kind of cringe, but I didn't really know any different. Um, that's just sort of what you did um, in the South, in Central Virginia. Um, but now I work for a company of all women and a few good men, 1,500 you, women. You, to be clear, you guys are big fans of skirts. It's just the having to I wear them. I love skirts. Yeah. So I'm not saying skirts are a bad thing. I'm saying- The expectation. The yeah. expectation of, of being a certain person. Um, and, and now, coming into, now I work in a company where it's celebrated who you are. If you follow me on Instagram, you know that. Like, I wear crazy things. Um, this one's relatively normal for the Instagram it, I kind of toned seen. it down a little, yeah, but to be cool. honest. Check the Instagram out. This is my, bu this is my business suit. I like it. <laughs> um, 
but but it is freeing, and I, I you know I talked about this before about like fashion freeing you and becoming an expression of who you are. And for me, that's that was part of it, like dressing how I felt inside and expressing that out loud to people, and it was a way of me saying this is me showing up in the world in this way, and it's okay. So yeah, I have ahead. to say I feel really blessed because my upbringing was my parents told me I could be anything I wanted to be. And throughout, you know, my career and even my, my uncle here uh, was one of the first that in the 70s, you know, put uh, women on his board. And, you know, I mean, it was always, uh, you know, really, really promoting women. And what I found in, in, in my career is, is that the, the people, the men of my father's age, and uh, he died in November at almost 94, and my uncle, I mean, they were, they were the same age or very close, and those, uh, those men were actually very, very supportive of women. And then there were, there were pockets of men that are probably closer in my age that were really struggling as I think women were coming into the workplace. And so my favorite story was I was working for my uncle, he, um, my aunt still has it, Northeast State Bank across the river, not too far from your church, I bet. And, uh, and so I remember uh, one of the guys there uh, walked in and handed me this piece of paper, and he said, can you make a copy? And I said, what's wrong with your finger? Is it broken? And he was like, and I said, do I need to show you how to use the copy machine? And so then I took his finger, and I went over, and I opened the <laughs> lid, put the piece of paper there, shut it down, and I, and I put his finger on the button and said, that's how it works. Don't ask me again. <laughs> was that woman splaining? Is that what that was? That was woman splaining. Uh, that was. That's what that, that was. That was. But um, the, the point was made. He never asked me again. <laughs> that was awesome. Um, well, we are. We're, this has gone. This time has gone really fast. What I'm going to ask you to think about is the kind of the encouragement you want to give to these ladies before we um, have a time for a little bit more time. We want to end right on time. So if you do want to meet some other people, you have a chance to do that. So just think about that. Um, and I'll just say to the people who are in this room who, uh, like me, are in positions for me as a lead pastor of a church that are, I think the phrase we would use is male-dominated still. I know there's some of you out there. And for all women, I think we have that tendency to feel like we're stuck between being too much and not enough all the time. And it's accentuated in a whole other way when you're in a male-dominated job. And so just to say to all of you, uh, my favorite meme right now, uh, that meme on the internet, on Instagram, is you can't make everybody happy, you're not chocolate. <laughs> Joe hates chocolate, so the, break, the metaphor breaks down. But there is, just, there is just no way we can downplay the work that we need to do inside of ourselves to recognize that absolutely, of course, you can't be all the things that people would hope that you would be. You can't step into those roles and be able to represent all women in those roles because you're in a male-dominated space. That is not real. And who are the truth tellers in your life that remind you, of course you're not gonna do that, why are you trying? I need those people in my life, that's the thing I would encourage those of you who are in that, in those spaces that feel male dominated, I guess is what I would say. And um, if we can do that, then we can bring our whole self in a way that we can really represent all that God made us to be, but we need those people to remind us. So my, my challenge and encouragement to you would be, who are those people that may not be at your workplace, especially if there's not a lot of other women, but who are those women or men who remind you that you don't have to be all the things, you just need to be at the best of your ability who you are every day, and that's all we can really do. And then you don't have to be more or not, or you're not enough in that way. So what would be just your encouragement uh, to these women before we wrap up? You wanna start? Sure. Um, I, well, I, I read a book recently, well, like half of a book, but then I got the idea, and so then I therefore read the book. <laughs> no offense. So to, true. To authors. So good. Yes, it's so good. So good. Um, it, the struggle it, is real. It's about, <laughs> you have three kids. Um, it's about work habits, and um, he talks about, the author talks about setting your intention. So setting your intention before a meeting, setting your intention for the day, setting your intention um, during a transition time, as you're getting out of the car and going into something. And I thought, man, that, that sounds like a spiritual practice. That, that's very close to what I do with my faith. Um, and my encouragement is, is finding those places and moments 
in your day, in your week, where you can set your intention, where you can ground yourself in your faith and in yourself and who God created you to be, and then move forward out of that. And then everything becomes a spiritual practice, whatever work you're doing. Absolutely, love it. That's good. Um, I was thinking, I, I feel like, it, I say this a lot at the minute, because I'm repetitive, um, that I feel we're in a bit or of a... Or consistent. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I like that. Let's do that one. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, because I'm consistent, I say this a lot um, right now. Um, I think we're in something of a moment for women. And um, culturally, you know, um, where women's voices are being heard more, finally, um, whether it's a hashtag that finally, I mean, we know Toronto Burke said it years ago, but culturally became more recognized. Um, and, um, and it's a poignant moment, you know, but this is what happened. I mean, leaders, leaders define the culture and their language creates, creates culture. Otherwise, why else would the casting couch be called the casting couch instead of rape? You know, um, because there weren't many women's stories or voices being told then that that became the language of the day to describe what we're now actually hearing about. And so as we hear women's voices, we, it's really clear that we need women in multiple spaces and leading in multiple spaces and influencing and defining culture in multiple spaces. I think for us as women of faith, I think there's that ongoing challenge of what are we allowed to be and do. That even if, and for some of us it's a really loud thing and for some of us it's just a niggling Thing when we wonder whether we're allowed to be ambitious, which I think we are, um, and all of that. And so there's just one word I would like to unpack very quickly. Um, in Genesis 2.18, the word that has often been bludgeoned or whatever amongst us is about a woman being a helper. And it's like, and it's, it's, the, room that, it's the word that sucks the air out of a room um, in terms of like, that's great and all, but I, I'm happy to help. But is that it kind of thing? And um, I'm a nerd, and I'm a language nerd, and in the Hebrew, the word is Aza. And it's a combination of, two, of a number of words, meaning to rescue and to save and to be strong. Um, it's a verb as well as a noun, meaning to protect, surround, defend, and cherish. It's a word with military connotations. Most of the times the word is used, it's when God is delivering people from their enemies. Um, and in Hebrew, cult, in the culture of the day, it meant someone who had the power and the resources to do something and help. And I know even in this room, the th our theological spectrum is wide. So I'm actually not even talking about positions or roles right now. I'm talking about our DNA, our God-given DNA. And I would encourage you, um, when thinking of who you are and what you bring to the table, um, to reclaim the word Aza rather than feel you're too strong or too much. And that's the first word used to describe women. Yeah. And you, yes, yes, absolutely. I, I know a lot of people in this room are the people that are like, can you just say what it means again one more time? Because now I have my pen out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a combination of words um, meaning to rescue and to save and to be strong. Oh, it's on my Instagram. Thank you. Joe yes, it's at on my Joe Saxon. Um, and it's a verb as well as a noun, meaning to protect, surround, defend, and cherish. Um, there are about 100 plus references to it in the Old Testament. Um, most of the times it's used, the direct word used, it's when God's delivering his people from their enemies. And that's E-Z-E-R in, yeah. the, in the English way that we reference yeah. the Hebrew. Great. Terry, last okay, but not least. That's, that's a hard act to follow. Um, <laughs> What I would say is this, is that we're all children of God and he loves each one of us. Mm. And we have to remind ourselves of that because in the workplace and at home, we are, we are um, uh, contributors to the workplace. We're moms, we're daughters, and, and we face those challenges and those competing priorities each and every day. And so we have to continually to remind ourselves that we're children of God and God loves us because we can't please everybody all the time. Uh, I don't know how many of you, but yes, I had a, I had a daughter where I, I was driving home at 5 o'clock one night, and she had called me and left seven messages on my cell phone to tell me, Mom, you forgot to pack me a lunch today. Mom, where's the lunch? Mom, are you going to bring lunch? And so imagine my horror as I'm driving home at like 7 o'clock in the evening, and I was hoping that somebody fed my daughter lunch because obviously I didn't pack her lunch. And it's those kinds of struggles that I think we face 
as women every day, and so we just have to keep reminding ourselves we're all children of God, and, and he loves us, warts and all. Amen. And we can't do anything to deserve more of that love, and there's nothing we can do to lose it. That's great. Thank you. Can we thank these women for their wise words and their stories? Thank you so much.